Hebrews chapter 11, believe it or not, this is part 19 in our series, The Hall of Faith. And we're gonna read for context, verse 30, and then into 31, our new section for today. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. And if you missed last week's study, you can hear all about that. In verse 31, it says, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with, uh, with peace. Now, don't raise your hand, and I need to say this twice, like, please don't raise your hand, but just think about this question. Are any of you, if you were to be honest with yourself, would you consider yourself to be critical of others? Would you consider yourself to be a critical person? There was an article on ksl.com, the website that read, and this was the headline, signs you are being overly critical and how to stop. Some of you may wanna visit that website right now. And I thought to myself when I read this, I thought, ah, this should be interesting. And one of the main statements read like this, and I quote, if your comments often make people angry or hurt their feelings, you may be overly critical. Are you extremely opinionated and have a hard time not sharing your ideas? People who are overly critical are often overly opinionated too. Can you let someone be wrong and not correct them? End of quote. Now, some of you may respond to those pointed questions by replying that you're not critical. Uh, you're just extremely observant. You're not critical. You're just picky with very high standards. Hey, I'm not critical. I'm just not comfortable with things not going the right way. In verse 31 of Hebrews 11, we have a name mentioned here that has caused readers to scratch their heads for nearly 2,000 years. Did I just read this correctly in Hebrews 11:31? Who inserted this person's name after the fact? Because if you've been trekking along with us, it's by faith, Abraham, by faith, Isaac, by faith, Jacob, by faith, Joseph, then by faith, Moses, and then by faith, Rahab? Did you notice that Joshua's name isn't even mentioned in Hebrews 11, though we brought that character to life in our last study that was connected with the walls of Jericho falling down? But even with that being said, it would appear at first glance that you would look at this and be like, hey, one of these things is not like the other. This list of people that we've looked to and admired. And now we read of Rahab the harlot. Would you please turn back in your Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. In verse one, it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Akasha Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And so they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. As you remember, the people of Israel were going to cross over the Jordan River, and they were to step into the promised land. They would be conquering those nations that had done wickedly before the Lord. Now, it wouldn't be something out of the ordinary for a lot of random men to be traveling to and fro from Rahab's storefront. A lot of foot traffic in the city of Jericho, a lot of strangers and shady characters would frequent Rahab's home. It would seem that that might be the perfect plan for two spies sent out by Joshua to happen upon Rahab's house. For it would appear for all the outsiders that it could just be business as usual. But that definitely was not the case for we will see God's plan, including what would appear as, listen to this, God 
especially going out of his way to save a pagan prostitute who was living in a wicked city about to be judged by God because of their great sin. Rahab was not an accident. Though her choice of occupation was not one of favor before the Lord, it's believed that Rahab lived in that lower, poorer area, area of the city of Jericho. There was the embankment wall, and then the wall of the city that was just above that, where there was a plateau, and then another wall that went up to the higher level of Jericho. She lived in the poorer area. Her home is believed that it was against the city wall, against that retaining above the retaining wall of the city of Jericho. And she even had a nice window with a view. Well, and how am I able to say that she had a nice window with a view? Well, I actually read ahead already. That's how I know. And in verse two, it says, it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. And so the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Uh oh, this is a problem now. The jig is up. They know that there are Israelites in Rahab's house. Now, I don't believe this was a common practice of bringing out the men who have gone into a harlot's house. There was to be a very special welcome sent down from the king of Jericho himself for the two men who had recently entered within the city walls. Someone had tipped off the royal court, it would seem, that there were strangers in the camp, and there were. I've often wondered, maybe you have, if someone saw the two spies that didn't look like they were from around there or what? I mean, I can't help but notice that when you're a righteous person, unrighteous people will be able to tell that you're not from around here, are you? You stick out like a sore thumb. You may not look too different from me externally, but there's something about your life that makes me think that you're not one of us. And when you're in a wicked city, the wicked knows, the wicked know who belongs to them and who does not. These two spies were up to something. And they weren't in Rahab's house for the normal reasons. And there's not even a hint of sexual immorality, by the way, with Rahab. So don't even try to go there. They were in the city of Jericho so that they might spy out the land for conquering. Often, there is a slight lack of information pertaining to the people of Israel's role in God judging wickedness. There have been critiques of the Bible of how could Israel go in and wipe out these inhabitants of the promised land? Well, I'd like to share something very, very fascinating with you, and it's from Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verses 13 and 14, and then I'll skip to 16 because it gives you a big picture. It says that God said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. God in his foreknowledge knew what was gonna happen in Egypt. And it says they will serve them for 400, or they will serve and they will be afflicted for 400 years. In Genesis 15, 14, it says, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possessions. But in the fourth generation, verse 16, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The iniquity of the Amorites. So God gives Abraham this foreknowledge, so kind of passing it on, saying, hey, where you're standing, the people that come after you will return. After they're in Egypt, they'll be enslaved. As you know, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, and the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. God sent Moses. Moses led them out with great possessions and wealth. The Lord blessed them, provided for them, and they would now head back to the promised land. 
But did you catch how odd this statement was that the Lord made? In the fourth generation, Israel will return to the promised land for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So Abraham's descendants would eventually, as you know, go through this whole ordeal and then come back at the time when the Amorites' iniquity was complete. What this means is that God is gracious and long-suffering, desiring that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says specifically that the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached its point for judgment during the time of Abraham, but it would as Israel would inherit the promised land. What does this mean? How does this apply to us today? To understand this, that the Lord would use Israel as his means for judging the sin of those in the promised land as they took the land. Even as, by the way, and this is straight across the board, that the Lord would use external nations to judge Israel when they sinned against the Lord. God is not unjust. And the same measure which you judge, you will be, it will be used against you. Or just to quote it directly from how Jesus said it in Matthew 7, 2, he said, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And so the Lord would use Israel under the leadership of Joshua to judge the sins of the city of Jericho and the surrounding nations. And the king of Jericho, he's after these men who had a special directive given to them by Joshua, especially spy out Jericho. And then in Joshua 2 verse 4, it says, And the woman took the, woman took the two men and hid them. And so she said, Yes, as the king said, these two men have come, send them out. She says, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them, she says, quickly, for you may overtake them. But then in verse 6, parenthetically, it's inserted here that she says, but she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Verse 7, then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So what do we just read here? Why would Rahab put her life on the line for two men that for all intents and purposes were her enemies? She not only put her life on the line, she lied to the king in order to hide spies from Israel. Now, because some people come up with weird ideas, I have to mention that Rahab's lie was neither commended or given a free pass in the scriptures. It was merely recorded. And again, it goes along the lines of not everything that is described in the scriptures is prescribed by God. This is a historical account. But back to the story. Whatever the case may be, something, something was happening in Rahab's heart. Her lie sent the king's soldiers on a wild goose chase in the middle of the night in the complete opposite direction as she protected the spies that were sent out by Joshua. So why would God send two of his best men, according to tradition, they believe that this could have been Caleb and then Eliezer the priest. Why would God send these two top guys to a random, low-income below low moral woman's house named Rahab? That's a great question. And the answer to that question is because God was doing a work in her life. God was ministering to a woman who had been destroying her life and there was really no way for her to save herself. She was a wicked woman in a wicked city whose time was up before God. But don't forget what the scriptures say in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. 
For the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. God was reaching the lost in a lost city. And a woman named Rahab heard the Lord's call. For we read in verse 8 that before they lay down the spies, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, verse 9, you ready for this? Listen to what she says. I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now, if I had previously known Rahab, it probably would have been something not uncommon to say is, uh, who are you and what happened to the Rahab who used to live here? This doesn't sound like the woman that she was known to be. But look at the things that Rahab says that she knows. Number one, she says that she knows that the Lord has given the people of Israel the land. That was significant back then, even as that is significant today. Secondly, it says that she knows that terror has fallen on everyone. Thirdly, she says that she knows that everyone is faint-hearted because of the people of Israel coming into the land. Now, this is not a coincidence that Rahab and the spies were connected. Only God can bring about such a supernatural encounter as which we are reading of today. Look at the things that led to Rahab's faith. And I say faith because, listen. She says, I've heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. I've heard what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan River. What she is describing here is the interaction that she had with the testimony of the power of the God of Israel. It affected her. This is a testimony. This is a description. This is a response to what she has seen, to what she has heard. What did she acknowledge? She, she said, I've heard that your God has power over Egypt. Your God has power over creation. Your God also has power over those that act sinfully. Did you catch that she said the Amorites... The Amorites, the same Amorites that were referenced by God to Abram when he said, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled. Now we see that this has gone full circle, that God has now at the appointed time used Israel as the means of judging the wickedness and the evil that has fully arrived with the Amorites. And in verse 11 of Joshua 2, it says, she says, And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. And then I highlighted this in my Bible, and you may want to do that yourself. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. What an amazing acknowledgement of the power of the Lord. What a profession of faith in the one true God by Rahab, of all people. Where this question is just rhetorically asked, who has the ability to scan, stand against the power of your God? King Jehoshaphat, one of the kings of Israel, prayed as he was being attacked by this axis of evil surrounding enemies. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6, he says, O Lord, God of our ancestors, 
You alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful, you are mighty, and no one can stand against you. Jehoshaphat was echoing what Rahab stated. And get this, as some would wanna say that God is unjust or God doesn't care about people or whatever it might be, the people of Jericho all heard the same news about Israel. They all did. Rahab said, we've all heard. We all know what happened coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, what you did to Og and Sihon, the Amorites, they were wicked and you guys wiped them out. We all heard about it. The message was the same for everyone. They all heard the same news. They all received the same message about the God of Israel, yet we only read of one woman and her family that put their faith in God. Sometimes we fail to understand that every nation has an appointed amount of time for rebellion against the Lord. You remember what I read about the Amorites, their iniquity was not yet complete. The same applied for Sodom and Gomorrah, as the Lord said he would spare the destruction of the city if there were 50 righteous. Okay, 45 righteous. Okay, 40 righteous. Okay, 30. Okay, 20. All right, finally, if there are 10 righteous people left in that city, I'll spare the city. And there wasn't found 10. And Lot and his family were led out of the city as it was destroyed. You know the story, Lot's wife turned around, turned into a pillar of salt. And if you just said, what? Well, I encourage you to go read it for yourself because it's a great story. In Jericho, there was one woman who made a profession of faith in a God she had only heard of. For me, I can't help but think what an amazing testimony to the grace of the Lord and the opportunity for anyone at any time in any place to receive salvation. Rahab. And in verse 12, she says, Now therefore, as she concludes her profession of faith, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. Rahab knew that God was going to judge her. Rahab knew that God was going to judge her city for their wickedness. And we read her ultimate request in verse 13, where she says, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. This makes Romans 6.23 pop all the more, like a beautiful gem laid on a black velvet backdrop. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there was nothing that Rahab could do before God to earn her salvation or counterbalance her sin. And this also, if you have not noticed it already, is perfectly positioned in Joshua and referenced in Hebrews 11, where we see coming to salvation a non Jewish person. This is crazy a non-Jewish person from a wicked city who was previously a prostitute has, ha has found faith in God. And we also acknowledge a really, really cool foreshadowing of God's fulfillment to his promise, fulfillment of his promise to Abraham by taking not only his descendants into the land of promise, but showing the salvation of promise and how faith saves you from your sin. This is brilliant how God does these things. Everything that we've been looking at in this letter to the Hebrews, everything that we've been studying in the book of Genesis and now into Exodus and Joshua, Faith saves. 
And so the men answered her, Our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Verse 15, then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall. There's my scriptural backing up from what I said that she had a nice view from her home. For she dwelt on the wall, verse 16, and she said to them, go to the mountains lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days, and she gives them some tips. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So the men said to her, verse 17, Joshua 2, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear. Unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. Verse 20, and if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Of all the colors that this cord could be, scarlet. Scarlet red. You hang this from your window and you will not be harmed. This is such a beautiful picture of the covering and protection of the Lord that it doesn't matter what may be happening around you. It's the Lord, your God, who saves. The world may be falling down around you like the walls of Jericho. Rahab's world would be literally falling down around her, but it would be her faith in the Lord and that action of helping the Lord's men and hanging the scarlet cord that would save her. In James chapter two, believe it or not, Rahab's name is mentioned again, verses 24 through 26. It says, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And if you've not studied James in context, what he's saying is that you can have a profession of faith all you want, but if you don't have the actions that support that faith, then your faith is dead. So my faith is exemplified by the way that I speak and what I do. Not just, hey, I'm a Christian. Because if I don't have a lifestyle that supports that, then that's not a true living faith. And James lays that out very clearly. And he even uses Rahab as not a woman that just had a profession of faith, but a action to support that. And so the walls of Jericho, they did come tumbling down. We saw that in our previous study. And Rahab, along with her home, were spared the wrath of God's judgment upon Jericho. She was saved. As everything went tumbling down, her home was the only one that remained. That scarlet cord draped from her window. And in Joshua 6, I believe, you can read the story for how she was recovered by Joshua and the men, but she was saved from the judgment of God on that city. And she's the only one, she's the only household that we read of being saved. So you remember at the beginning of our service, how I asked you to ask yourself if you were a critical person? I hope you didn't think I was gonna let that one go. How we view other people in the church can often be very critical. And specifically, just for you that might be replying in your mind right now, I want you to know what I'm saying. 
I am not speaking of lowering the standard of God's righteousness or being accepting of sin. But what I am saying is that we should be aware, we should be aware of this very, very important truth that we don't know how far behind the world may be for someone on their personal journey with the Lord. They could be just coming out of it or just shortly on their way. And of equal importance, like Rahab, we don't know how far ahead the Lord is going to take them and to what extent he's going to use them. So hopefully your heart was just opened a little bit. It it causes you and your spirit to maybe think in a different way. I don't know how far the world is behind for that person that's here today. And I also don't know how far ahead the Lord is going to take them and use them. Rahab would marry a man named Salmon. They would eventually have a son named Boaz, who would eventually marry a woman named Ruth. Boaz and Ruth would have a son named Obed, and Obed would be the proud father of a son named Jesse. Jesse himself liked large kids, and he had seven sons. And he and his wife would decide to have one last child, and that last child's name was David. Rahab would be the great-great-grandmother to King David from whom the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come. She's only one of two women mentioned by name in the Hall of Faith, her and Sarah. She was a pagan prostitute in a wicked city that was about to be destroyed by God because of their sin. But Rahab, because of her faith and repentance of sin, found herself in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? The same God that is working now is the same God that has been working since the beginning. Desiring that none should perish, that all should come to repentance, that the time of the wickedness of the Amorites was not yet fulfilled. It wasn't complete. God said, I have given them to the last moment to repent from their sin. And then because I'm a righteous God, I will judge them. And it wasn't just a one-way street. It was a two-way street because God was fair. And he was not going to allow sin to be judged here and then turn a blind eye to his own people. And we see that exemplified throughout the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. And so for us today, what an amazing story of God's faithfulness that God would go after the one it would seem. And not just seem, it is. He went after the one in the city of Jericho. Her name was Rahab. Jesus comes on the scene, walks amongst amongst his creation, and he says, he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And so when you read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That is exactly what it means. In Peter, when it says that God's not willing that any one person should perish, but that all should come to repentance, this has always been the heart of God. This is currently the heart of God. And even in the future, when we've been studying the book of Revelation, God gives 
the world one last chance before they take the mark of the beast and seal their own doom to destruction. And he has angels now. Previously, it was only men and women that were used to preach the gospel. In the last days before his second coming, he employs angels to preach the gospel to every tribe, every nation, every tongue, so that there is no one without excuse. That they all hear the message and they all have that chance to come to repentance. And so it would do us well as a church to have the heart of the Lord, the understanding of the Lord. Some are not far out of the world and some have a great future ahead of them by the leading of God. And whatever by whatever means we judge, it will also be measured back to us. And again, that's not a lowering of God's standards, that it's not a contradiction to the truths found in the scriptures. This, this is for us to understand the heart of the Lord and then hopefully do as good of job as we can to represent him, not only to the world around us, but to the church around us. And I think I would be remiss of my responsibilities as a pastor today in light of the things that we have heard in light of who God is if I didn't give you the opportunity here that if you're here and you have walked away from the Lord call it for how it is you have backslidden you've turned your back and you're in the ways of the world and you know that you ought not to be what a day to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, I commit my life to you. Would you forgive me? You can recommit your life to Jesus today. For those of you that may be here or may be watching or maybe you're a guest and you came just to check things out, what a great day to understand that no matter where you're from, what your upbringing might have been, that if you understand that the same God who will reach that one person, regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of their past mistakes, that he will reach that one and forgive and cleanse and then use in a, mass, in a massive way. What a great day for you to be here to commit your life to Jesus, to receive forgiveness of sin and to find eternal life. And so I'm gonna ask that you'd all close your eyes and bow your head and we're gonna pray. And if you're here this morning and you have a strong relationship with the Lord and you're walking with him and there's no need for, you know, recommitment of your life to the Lord, then I would just ask that you would pray in your own heart over those that need to recommit their life to the Lord today. That you would pray in your own heart for those that need Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And just intercede in the spiritual realm now as we pray. Father, you created every person unique. And you have given them a purpose. And Father, I want to first lift up those, Lord, who have walked away from you. Maybe they feel condemned. Maybe they feel guilt. Maybe they don't know how to move past knowing what was wrong and doing it anyway. I pray that today they would understand that God already saw their decisions and is still reaching out to them today, welcoming them with open arms to come back. Lord, I also want to pray for those that do not know you personally as their Lord and Savior. They could have been raised in the church, raised outside the church, raised in another faith, Lord, but now they're in a place as an adult to make their own decisions on what they believe. I pray, Lord, that they would know and that you would speak to them by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you desire that they should not perish in their sins, but find everlasting life, and that you love them so much. And with every eye closed and head bowed, if you're here today and you are one of that group that was prayed for that has walked away from the Lord, and you need to come back to the Lord, then I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and say, yes, that's me. I need to recommit my life to the Lord today. Would you just hold your hand up so I can pray for you? And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer of rededicating your life to Jesus today. You can just hold your hand up and I'm gonna pray for you. And also today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you'd like to be forgiven of your sins, then very simply, would you just raise your hand and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer as well. 
Father, we pray that you would move by your Holy Spirit now, Lord. I pray for those that might feel a little nervous. They might feel shame, whatever it might be, Lord. It's not about feelings. It's about the facts found in your word. And Lord, if we come to you, you won't cast us out. And so, Lord, whether they're rededicating their life to you or whether they're committing their life to you for the first time, even those that may not be here in person, watching from some other place, I ask, Lord, that their faith would be in you. And I'm going to lead you guys in a very simple prayer that if you need to rededicate or dedicate your life to the Lord, you can just repeat this prayer after me and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned, but I ask that you would forgive me of my sin and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for me. And I thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sins. Would you fill me with your love and your joy and your peace? And would you give me your strength that I may be who you've created me to be. For I give you my life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. If you prayed that prayer today, Pastor Jonathan and our prayer team will be available to help jumpstart this new relationship that you're starting with the Lord. If you need a Bible, we'll be able to get you a Bible, but you're gonna have to make your way over to my right, uh, your left. Uh, Pastor Jonathan and the team would love to pray over you and help you start this new relationship with the Lord. We have a great day planned as a church family. Looking forward to enjoying it with you. And not only do we get to rejoice that our sins are forgiven, that our names are written in the book of life, we rejoice that we're a new creation in Christ, that the old things have passed away and behold, all has been made new. And it doesn't stop there. And the list goes on and on. But one of the great things that we have to enjoy while we're here on this earth is our fellowship, our friendship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I hope that you're able this afternoon to meet a lot of new people, connect with some, enjoy some fellowship and some fun that we have after service today because God's blessed us and we're really, really thankful for all that. So may the Lord bless you today. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may he give you peace in Jesus' name.